introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, my name is Professor Peter Shepherd. I'm from the uh, medical school up the road, uh, and I'm reliably informed that our medical school wouldn't let this lecture be held there because it was too controversial. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had to come all the way down to help to be here. You know, I think um, before I introduce the speaker, I think this is a pivotal year in New Zealand uh, for a debate on all of these issues surrounding these many aspects of this, uh, this plant cannabis, uh, ranging from the referendum that's going to be held later in the year uh, through to the medicinal uses of it that we're here today to discuss. And this has uh, been often a debate clouded by all sorts of uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions. And, uh, you know, it's really time for us as a country to have a debate about the real facts. And a debate about the real facts means getting real experts who really know what they're talking about uh, in here and getting a rational debate from the partners and players in this country and a decisions about what we do as a country going forward. And I'm really pleased and thankful that Brewer Biosciences has been uh, here to, to catalyze this debate here tonight and discussion here and to support it because we need this rational discussion in our country. So it's a really a great honor to and a privilege to have uh, such an expert uh, as uh, Dr. Ethan Russo here tonight. Uh, he's been, uh, as you'll see from the CV, uh, the chairman and the president of various uh, societies that absolutely specialize uh, overall in the research of the cannabinoid components that make up uh, this, this plant, the marijuana, and understanding their effects, in his case, particularly on the brain and on on pain. But from uh, his many years of work, uh, he's able to give us a, an overview, uh, a you know, scientifically rational overview uh, of this area. And I think this is, even for me, the first time I've heard a rational, sort of scientifically driven uh, scientific presentation on, on this, to help us understand how these products can be used medicinally. So thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here, and we very much look forward to your presentation. So thanks so much. Um, I was asked to uh, have about two hours of uh, material. Um, basically, we're going to go through about 70 slides, and probably some of us will need a file break at that point. <laughs> and then I'll continue on, and we'll leave time for questions, and people can feel free to get on with their other evening activities uh, as they need to. I was just recently informed that uh, showing the coat of arms is uh, some kind of offense. Uh, not as a, uh, intended here. Uh, there was nothing about that in Wikipedia from whence I uh, lifted the slide. More importantly, my uh, email is up there. I do answer my email. It might take me some time, but uh, if you have questions or would like uh, source material, um, please ask and I'll be happy to comply. Uh, these days, whether people ask or not, it's usually uh, good to have a disclaimer. I have worked uh, with a variety of organizations. Um, right now, I'm technically unemployed, uh, despite everything you see here, and I'm not getting any money, uh, aside from the generous support that I've had from Rua Biosciences uh, to come uh, to New Zealand. So, you can read through that if you wish. Um, Basically, none of these arrangements really have anything to do with uh, the truth or validity of the material that we're going to discuss. Um, certainly, I have to indicate that um, little or none of uh, what I'm telling you tonight, uh, aside from the information on epidiolects as a treatment for seizures, has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And, and, uh, or other regulatory bodies. So, let us really begin. Um, so, the subject tonight is cannabis sativa, cultivated cannabis, on its relation to what's called the endocannabinoid system. From our point of view, it began with a plant called cannabis, although, uh, in the scheme of things, it's a species that's about 30 million years old whereas the endocannabinoid system is about 600 million years old. Uh, so we can say with assurance that it wasn't put on God's green earth to make us high or to heal us, but it is a 
happy accident of nature. Um, so the plant makes these glandular trichomes that you see up here. And of course, that's the source of tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, the main psychoactive ingredient of cannabis. Again, in a happy accident of nature, this is quite analogous to endogenous cannabinoids, uh, cannabinoids within, particularly in anandamide, in that both are weak partial agonists on what's called the CB1 receptor, uh, <clears throat> which is the receptor in the brain that's responsible for the psychoactivity, uh, but additionally pain control and a lot of other um, important functions. There are actually three categories of cannabinoids. Uh, phytocannabinoids are plant-based cannabinoids, they're what THC and, and uh, cannabidiol are. Uh, we used to say that these were exclusively found in cannabis, but we now have other examples, including an indigenous one uh, in New Zealand in the form of the little wart, Radulum marginata. So this is of great interest to us. Uh, as mentioned, we have endocannabinoids, uh, natural compounds that bind to these same receptors. Um, and the functions have been categorized by Professor DiMarzo in Italy as relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. But we could have 30 other descriptors that would also apply to this. And additionally, they can be synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, some of which were actually designed before we knew the existence of the receptor. Um, so those are the three. Uh, this is one of the more complex depictions we're going to see. Uh, what we've got is the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. Now we usually think of neurotransmitters as being secreted here and going across the synapse and causing uh, synaptic transmission in the postsynaptic cell. But the endocannabinoids are not neurotransmitters, they're neuromodulators. In general, these are produced on demand in the postsynaptic neuron and go back and affect the receptor and then inhibit the release of neurotransmitters. So if, for example, uh, this is a glutamatergic neuron, uh, in a case of neuropathic pain where there's too much transmission there, this would inhibit that and reduce pain through that and various other mechanisms. Um, some of this we've already said, uh, but the endocannabinoid system in general terms is an innate homeostatic mechanism that affects almost every aspect of our physiology. So you name it, whether it's digestion, emotion, whether you're going to vomit, whether you're going to have a seizure, it's all regulated by this system. Um, I've mentioned CB1, cannabinoid 1 receptor in the brain, spinal cord, and throughout the body. Uh, but there's also a CB2, which is not psychoactive, but does also affect pain and inflammation, and is found primarily in immune tissues, uh, but can be found in the brain under conditions of insult. Um, we have to include things like the trip V1 receptor, where capsaicin, the active ingredient in chili peppers, works. Uh, and uh, the endocannabinoid system also encompasses the enzymes that make and break down uh, these same endocannabinoids. Um, so, uh, there was a concept that was presented by Professor Michelin circa 1998, which is called the entourage effect. What this described was a situation in which the main characters, anandamide, for example, were supplemented by other compounds that were closely related, but seemingly were inactive on their own. But when they were there together, there was a synergy of boosting of the effect. And the same applies to components of cannabis. And we'll certainly get into that more as we go along. CB1 is highly expressed in the brain, but particularly in uh, areas having to do with coordination, pain, and emotion, uh, movement, etc. Um, very importantly, they're very much fewer in most areas of the brainstem, particularly in the uh, lower areas of the medulla, so that there is no dose of a cannabinoid that can stop breathing the way that opioids do. And so there's no such thing as a fatal overdose 
uh, from cannabis unless someone chokes on it when they're trying to um, eat the contents of their baggie or evade the police. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't occur in this country. <coughs> um, just another depiction that goes on from the brain to indicate that this system is also active in the spinal cord and in the periphery, um, particularly in the gut, um, where it controls not only uh, pain and other functions, but additionally propulsion and excretion. Uh, I would just mention here that uh, cannabis was one of the first treatments in the 19th century for cholera because it d diminished uh, the abundant secretion that led to the problems uh, with that disorder. Um, although this is not commonly taught in medical school, the endocannabinoid system, uh, if we put cannabis aside, one might really question why that is. Because uh, the CB1 receptor is the most abundant G protein coupled receptor in the brain, more than all those for all of the neurotransmitters combined. So you might consider that it's important uh, in the way we function. Um, and uh, as listed here, as I've already mentioned, it affects pain, memory, movement, emotion, appetite, on and on and on. Um, it's hard to think of a physiological function wherein the endocannabinoid system does not have a role. And it's also involved, particularly CB2, as mentioned in um, peripheral kinds of pain and inflammation. Uh, it is immunomodulatory, um, and uh, Professor Michelle again has uh, felt that this is a, a sort of defense for uh, non-antigen-induced injury. Um, drugs that would stimulate the CB2 receptor seem to have great promise in treating fibrotic disorders like cirrhosis of the liver on uh, related conditions and also have a role in treating addictions uh, to a variety of substances. And the slide just shows all the places that CB2 uh, affects function. And um, this is an excellent paper that's worth reading, although it's a few years old now. It really uh, hasn't met its equal. Uh, additionally, we've got both CB1 and CB2 in the skin, where it, again, has to do with pain, inflammation, itch, uh, things of this sort. And through the study of uh, the role of the endocannabinoid system, we've come up with the uh, prospect that in the future we may be using cannabidiol to treat acne, which has an antibiotic effect on the uh, probiotic bacterium acnase that uh, feeds on the sebum. Uh, and it is a, a sebostatic agent. It uh, reduces the output of the material that the bacteria feed on. Um, and it mediates this through another TRIP receptor, the TRIP V4. Uh, and again, now this is just to de depict that this is working on every physiological system. And it looks like this is a heartless, spineless guy. It uh, works on the bone, too. Uh, in fact, it was shown a few years ago by Natalia Kogan uh, that CB, uh, CBD stimulates bone fracture healing. And it may be in contradistinction to the situation today where any kind of cannabinoid is forbidden for athletes that we may be treating them for their fractures uh, with this agent in the future. And um, while we're at it, CBD has no uh, addiction potential uh, at all. And, uh, most countries, it's not a scheduled drug, um, but it is guilt by association since we usually find it in conjunction with THC. So again, cannabis sativa, if you were um, on the proverbial desert island and had to pick one plant, this is your best choice. Um, legality aside, uh, because it can supply your food with uh, one of the most balanced uh, combinations of essential fatty acids and digestible protein. Uh, you could fuel uh, with the oil. Uh, you can make clothes from the, the fiber from the stalks and, and treat a variety of illnesses. And this is a dioecious plant, meaning that it has separate sexes on, on each plant in uh, distinction to most other kinds of plants. 
There's an ancient tradition of medicinal use of cannabis, and this is a depiction in various ancient languages. Um, I'll just point out a couple. Um, I like this one in particular um, in Chinese. Um, in the kanji, what we're seeing is a depiction of stalks of hemp upside down drying in a shed, and anywhere in China. Um, and that, that's the truth. This is not something that somebody made up. Um, and uh, though this is controversial, um, in Exodus, there's mention of cannabosum, uh, aromatic cane, uh, which was part of the holy anointing oil, uh, combined with cassia, cinnamon, and other ingredients. And um, this may well have been burned for its psychoactive effect. And then the more uh, recognizable cannabis with the proper uh, accent on the first syllable. The uh, cannabinoids are primarily um, produced in glandular trichomes that are in the unfertilized female flowering tops. And as you can see here, um, they're about 18 times more productive uh, than what you'll find uh, in the leaves. Um, so people will use these, but um, it's really not the uh, best source uh, at all. Uh, similarly, the males are usually culled because they, uh, as in many other social contexts, uh, they ruin the situation. Um, this is a, definitely a female-centric plant uh, for good reason. And this is a depiction of a couple of different kinds of glandular trichomes where the cannabinoids and terpenoids are produced. The one on the right is called the sessile glandular trichome. And in the uh, unfertilized flowering tops, you have rather the capitate, meaning a head, glandular trichome that's on the stalk. The plant does this because the material inside, the cannabinoid acids, are actually toxic to the plant and will produce a pruning of the lower fan leaves, which the plant uh, does to um, preserve its resources and attempt to get fertilization, which we humans thwart in our effort to get medicine from it. Um, and if you remember the volume of a sphere from your high school uh, geometry, um, there's only a tiny amount of material in these sessile uh, trichomes as opposed to the larger capitate glandular trichomes. Uh, this is from a paper uh, that I wrote uh, a few years back with uh, J.R. Marcou. And it's just showing the different parts of the plant and its versatility. We're going to be concentrating on the flower, uh, but there's a great deal of utility to other parts. Um, and so the fan leaves, although they're much, much lower in cannabinoids, uh, produce a useful product in the form of canaprene, uh, which has great potential as an anti-inflammatory agent. Um, there's uh, in the stalks, obviously, fiber uh, of great use. Um, you mentioned already the seeds. Um, they're a rich source of adestin protein, uh, which is compared to genistein and soy is indigestible and needs to be sprouted or fermented before it's fit for human use. Um, and uh, there's uh, additionally uh, bioactive compounds in the roots. Alkaloids were sought in the flowers for decades, but none were found. Um, there are alkaloids in the roots and triterpenoids, which also have anti-inflammatory um, and anti-cancer properties. Uh, so we have this divergence of chemical content, but a convergence of, of utility. Uh, so it's an incredibly complex and fascinating plant. These are the biosynthetic pathways uh, for the cannabinoids. We've got um, two primary precursors, olivatolic acid and germinal pyrophosphate. But there's also the possibility of diverinic acid, which has a three carbon side chain instead of, of uh, five. Um, and uh, from these, we get production of um, the cannabinoid acids first cannabigerolic acid, uh, and then usually it'll go quickly into the others, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, cannabidiolic acid, etc. Uh, but again, 
Um, if there's a three carbon side chain instead of five, you get a whole other series of uh, variant compounds. Additionally, however, um, one of the precursors uh, is also the source of the terpenoids that are also produced in the glandular trichome. So geranyl pyrophosphate um, is a parent compound uh, for the monoterpenoids, which begin typically with limonene and then branch out into many others. Um, beyond that, they're also the source uh, for the sesquiterpenoids. The monoterpenoids are 10 carbon and sesquiterpenoids are 15 carbon, and we'll be describing a few of these later. So, tetrahydrocannabinol, um, or THC. This was first identified in 1964 by Professor Mishulam and Gaoni in Israel. Uh, as mentioned, it's a weak partial agonist at the CB1 receptor. Uh, it's a painkiller and good for itch. It's also bronchodilatory. In the 19th century, there were cannabis cigarettes used to treat asthma. Uh, it is a neuroprotective antioxidant. Ironically, although this remains a Schedule I forbidden compound in my country, the United States government has a patent uh, on its use as a neuroprotective antioxidant. Only in America, as we say. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond the effects on CB1, THC has 20 times the anti-inflammatory power of aspirin and twice that of hydrocortisone. So this is mediated other ways. It is a very powerful muscle relaxant, which is the reason behind uh, the use of Sativax approved in 30 countries to treat spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Uh, it is an antiemetic, hence its use in treating chemotherapy-associated uh, nausea. Uh, of course, it's the primary psychoactive component, and it does all these things without being a COX-1 or COX-2 inhibitor, so it does not produce ulcers, strokes, and heart attacks. Um, a really interesting one that hasn't been harnessed as yet is it reduces the production of beta amyloid and it might be part of the armamentarium for treating Alzheimer's disease in, in the future. We'll see. Um, normally, I have a bunch of slides on cannabidiol. I think we've only got a couple tonight. This was actually isolated earlier uh, by Adams in 1940, but um, he didn't quite get the structure right, and that happened in 1963 uh, by Professor Mishulam again. Um, it does not bind directly to either CB1 or CB2. We knew for a long time that when CBD was present, it interfered with some of the activity, act as an antagonist to what THC did. But it was only a few years ago that this was explained. There is another binding area on the receptor called the allosteric site, and it works as a negative allosteric modulator, meaning that it changes the conformation of the receptor, making binding to, to THC a little bit more difficult. Uh, again, a neuroprotective antioxidant with a patent in the US, um, and it's uh, uh, better at this activity than vitamin C or vitamin E. Uh, it's also a trick V1 agonist. Uh, it works on the same receptor uh, as capsaicin. Unlike capsaicin, which is caustic, um, we like it because of the heat, some of us. Um, but um, this also can stimulate that receptor and desensitize it without having this caustic effect. Um, about 2005, we didn't have an explanation for the known fact that cannabidiol is a very powerful anti-anxiety agent. So I wondered, we knew that it wasn't binding directly to CB1 and CB2, I wondered if it might be mediated through serotonin. Uh, so we looked at this, and in fact, cannabidiol is a 5-HD1A agonist. Uh, and it's turned out to be not just the mechanism of action in treating anxiety, but also uh, for a number of other things. It also is antiemetic, and it's mediated through 5-HD1A, um, and also, uh, apparently, is a mechanism of action in treating encephalopathy associated with hepatic failure. Um, another activity that seems to be important in chronic use is that this will 
um, increase release of an anamide and inhibit its breakdown. So it's acting analogously to the way a, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor would work on serotonin, but this time increasing the amount of an anamide and hence what we call endocannabinoid tone. There are a lot of misconceptions about CBD, so much that I thought I'd need to write an article on that. Um, a lot of companies will tout that we have five milligrams of CBD. Um, that really isn't enough to do very much. Um, although this is an incredibly versatile medicine with 30 known mechanisms of action or more, it's not potent. What that means medically is you need numbers uh, for it to really do its best work. Um, it's commonly misportrayed as being sedative. It is not. Low and moderate doses of CBD are actually stimulating in isolation. However, commonly this is present with THC and particularly with high levels of mercine, uh, which is quite sedating. Uh, so this creates that misperception. Um, and uh, there's also debate now. This has been uh, has got a very easy legal status in the U.S. According to the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, and the Drug Enforcement Administration, it is still a Schedule One illegal drug. Um, but you, in the States, you can order it on the Internet and even buy it in a gas station, petrol station. Um, uh, the one I hate uh, is that it turns into THC in the body. Not true. It was known in 1940 that if you expose CBD to a strong acid, you can turn it into DEC. Uh, a couple of years ago, a group that was making CBD patches wanted to say this is better than taking it orally because it won't turn into DEC. Uh, so they simulated gastric acid and let CBD sit there for an hour and they produced DEC. Hence proof although it's not, because this does not happen in your body, and we do not have biosynthetic mechanisms for turning CBD into THC. Subsequently, although this hasn't been published, a uh, Brazilian group, uh, CRIPA et al., has given huge doses of, in several hundred patients, uh, huge doses of CBD and found no THC conversion. So that one's a myth. Uh, just another diagram from an article showing the progress uh, from uh, CBD in a hemp field in Kentucky um, to the flower. Uh, again, our trichomes here. Um, and uh, again, the biosynthetic pathway. That's what pure crystals of CBD look like. In your body, it turns into 7 hydroxycannabidiol which may or may not be active. We don't know precisely yet. And again, it doesn't turn into THC unless you're exposing it to a strong acid outside the body. Um, I touched on this before, the idea of the entourage effect. Then year after they first described the entourage effect, Professor Mishulam and Ben Shabbat uh, pointed out that the same idea of the entourage could apply to plants. And I'll read, this type of synergism may play a role in the widely held but not experimentally based view that in some cases plants are better drugs than the natural products isolated from them. Well, it's been more than 20 years since this statement was made and we now have abundant evidence uh, that this is true and it is experimentally based and hopefully we'll have some demonstrations of that. I wanted to shift into some of what people consider minor cannabinoids. Um, that's a way of saying that uh, we haven't utilized or studied these as much. Um, CBG or cannabigerol is a parent compound uh, to the others once it's uh, decarboxylated. Um, this is a very interesting agent that I think is the next big thing, if you will. Um, so it is a GABA uptake inhibitor. It's stronger than THC or CBD, which may explain that this is a superb uh, anti-anxiety agent and may have some uh, interesting muscle relaxing effects, although that 
hasn't been researched. Um, it's shown the antidepressant effects in animal models. Uh, it has a mild antihypertensive effect and can lower intraocular pressure as THC does. Um, it decreases ker keratinocyte production in psoriasis. A uh, really interesting one is that it's a strong antibiotic against uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Um, and uh, it also works on several trip channels, um, particularly trip ME, which makes it a good uh, candidate for treatment of prostate cancer. Um, so, tetrahydrocannabivirin, or THCV, is like THC, but it's got a propyl side chain instead of a pentyl. Uh, this was identified clear back in 1970, but nobody did any work on what it did. Um, very interesting profile. At low or moderate doses, it is a neutral antagonist at the CB1 receptor. So it allays hunger, it's good for the metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, things of this sort. At high concentrations, it flips over into being an agonist. This is a feature of many cannabinoids, what's called a biphasic dose response curve, that it does a different thing at a low dose or a high dose. And so it is important how much you give. Sometimes less is more. So, um, Beyond its effect on hunger, uh, this is a prominent anticonvulsant. Uh, it's been effective in treating neuropathic pain. Um, and um, one benefit that really hasn't been harnessed yet with all these weight loss drugs that have been taken off the market due to toxicities is it doesn't do what they do. Uh, for instance, the drug Ramonaban that was approved for a brief time in Europe as a weight loss drug was taken off the market because it's what's known as an inverse agonist. It would actually lower the activity of the endocannabinoid system in general, so it should not have been a surprise that it reduced hunger, but also made people depressed, anxious, made them more likely to get an MS, have seizures, tumors, etc. Anyway, um, some of us suspected that that would be the case, but nobody listened to me at that point in my life. Hopefully things are different now. We'll see. Um, back in the, the uh, 60s, again, the acids that form in the plant uh, production, these were largely relegated to being inactive which is a way of saying we weren't as sexy as THC and didn't get people high. That's true, but the rest is not. This has turned out to be a very useful compound, and some people that have been using raw cannabis for decades knew as much. Um, I'll just concentrate on the important stuff. Um, so this is the main form in the unheated flower. Uh, it kills bugs. Uh, it's also anti-inflammatory uh, through uh, effects on tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, interestingly, it seems to be anticonvulsant, uh, although it's not supposed to pass the blood-brain barrier. In severe epilepsy, however, there's a breakdown of that, and that probably explains how it gets in. Um, it is a very strong anti-dematic. Um, then, uh, Real possibilities have been introduced by the discovery a couple of years ago that this works on another receptor, the PCAR gamma receptor, which is a nuclear receptor that affects gene transcription. Drugs that also do this will um, be effective on, in, uh, uh, for producing weight loss, but also treating cancer um, and a, a variety of other conditions. Uh, so this is very promising. Its counterpart uh, in, in uh, raw hemp would be cannabidiol acid or CBDA. Uh, again, a natural herbicide. Um, this one can produce cox inhibition, but at ridiculous doses, which probably never be necessary. Um, it is also, like CBD, active at the 5-HT1A receptor, but with 100 times the potency of CBD. Um, so this may do similar things, but at a tiny, tiny dose. 
historically, raw hemp was used uh, by the Renaissance herbalists in treating a variety of tumors. And although this has not been researched, uh, this would be a promising area for investigation. Now we're going to turn to the, the terpenoids. Um, this is a table from a uh, paper from 2011. Um, and you see a, a variety of familiar plants, lemon, pine needles. Oh, look, hemp, uh, I'm sorry, hops, stroviles, um, and uh, lavender. These are depicted because they'll be familiar scents to many of you, but these are all found in, in cannabis as well. So the terpenoids are the aromatic compounds found in cannabis and other plants. Um, besides their nice smells and, and flavors in some instances, uh, these can be anti-inflammatory, analgesic, can have antibiotic activity, and many of them are psychoactive. And they work in synergy with the phytocannabinoids. Um, there is a lot on this page. I just uh, am allergic to decreasing the content of my slides. Um, <laughs> this is all my papers, but we're just going to do the highlights uh, tonight. We're not going to be here all night. Um, alpha pinene um, is the most abundant terpenoid in nature, but it's actually pretty uh, rare in cannabis just because the braiding has gone in a different direction. Um, this is a uh, bronchodilator like THC. Um, it is a wide spectrum antibiotic. Um, its most important activity is as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So that acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, the memory molecule in the brain. So if you're inhibiting its breakdown, it means you've got more acetylcholine and you remember better. One of the main side effects of THC is, uh, oh yeah, short-term memory impairment. Okay? That wasn't pharmacologically induced. But what alpha pinene will do is reduce or eliminate the short-term memory impairment. So if you have a patient that has chronic pain but has to work or study, they should be looking for alpha pinene in their preparation so that they can get pain relief and still function. And this absolutely can do the job. Um, and it also helps explain uh, the Japanese ha habit of uh, shinrin yoku or forest bathing, where you go into the woods um, and gain um, pining uh, from the ambient atmosphere and clear your head. And that is not just psychological, it is a uh, pharmacological effect. Uh, another one that we don't see enough of is limonene, which is very familiar. It's uh, the foundation of citrus scent. There's a reason when you walk down the, uh, the church and aisle in the supermarket that you're bombarded with citrus. <coughs> Psychologically, this denotes cleanliness to us. Uh, additionally, it is a very good cleaning agent, but it also is a mood elevator, very powerful antidepressant. There was a, a study done in Japan where they had uh, a ward of depressed patients on medication where they cut their Hamilton depression scores in half by wafting citrus scent into the air and got a bunch of people off of their medicine. It is all also immune stimulation an immune stimulator. Uh, it has primary effect on various cancer cell lines, including breast cancer. On its own, uh, when it was tested in phase two, it was not effective, but in conjunction with the cannabinoids, I expect that it will be. Uh, it also works on the adenosine A2A receptor, as does THC, and as does CBD, uh, but through different mechanisms. And uh, we're waiting to see if there is synergy in, in that activity. Then a final one uh, that really could make it popular. Um, limonene has the ability to, to turn white fat, the storage fat from obesity, into brown fat, a metabolically active uh, fat that's uh, good for energy production. Uh, so this may be part of a weight loss regimen in the future. Linalool is going to be familiar as the scent of lavender. Um, uh, 
a lot of people, this reminds them of the grandmothers because uh, she used it in a sachet in the linen closet. Uh, but this is well known as an anti-anxiety agent. Essential oil of lavender has been used to calm agitated, demented patients. Uh, it's also a very powerful local anesthetic and does uh, a pronounced anticonvulsant activity. Um, our colleague uh, Dustin Sulak in the state of Maine has uh, documented a situation in which a child who was taking other cannabis preparations and being pain controlled seizures did once they found a chemovar, a chemical variety of cannabis that had mineral. Uh, then we're going to mention one of the sesquiterpenoids, the 15 carbon ones. This is beta caryophylline, which is common to um, black peppercorns. Um, it was been known uh, traditionally that this was a strong anti-inflammatory agent. It's a main component of copaiba balsam that's used by indigenous people in South America. Um, it's also been documented as being stronger uh, or comparable potency to phenylbutazone, uh, which is uh, used to, as a uh, non-steroidal for horses and is too toxic for humans. But in contrast, caryophylline protects the gastric mucosa from ulcers. All this was uh, explained uh, when your Gerich in Switzerland found out that this is not just a terpenoid, but also a cannabinoid because it is a strong um, agonist at the CB2 receptor. So it does not make people high, but in, in, instead uh, has analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect. Similar drugs that are agonists of CB2 have been used uh, to treat uh, cocaine addiction in animals, and um, I feel strongly that this would be part of a regimen to use cannabis-based medicines uh, to treat human addictions. Um, I threw this in uh, to show what some combinations could do, particularly in the area of psychopharmacology. Uh, so to tr treat depression, a little bit of THC, some CBD, CBG, and limonene might be a good mixture. Um, similarly, for anxiety, CBD works on its own, but might work better with limonene and linalool. Um, for agitation and Alzheimer's disease, uh, again, the THC-CBD combination uh, with any of these uh, terpenoids. Um, and a variety of agents would help with sleep. Uh, for addiction, I'd be really interested in the combination of CBD and caryophylline that work with uh, very distinct mechanisms one to the other. And I wanted to mention something about uh, lamb races. Lamb races are types of cannabis that have been grown in a particular area for many generations. So these have typically come from traditional growing areas. Uh, in the old world, uh, this would be uh, Nepal, Afghanistan, Morocco. Uh, in the new world, it would include places like Colombia and Mexico, where you know, there might have been 100 years or more. So these would be uh, types of cannabis that were accustomed to local environments. They know how to deal with the predators. Uh, they're accustomed to the soil and the weather conditions. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these heirloom varieties have been lost. If you go to places like Jamaica and Colombia, you'll find supplantation of um, the lamb races with uh, seeds that came from California or from the Netherlands, uh, which really weren't designed to grow there, but uh, it's, again, market forces um, for uh, recreational use of, of causes kind of of loss, um, and we don't know what uh, great traits similarly may have been lost that we'd like to harness for selective breeding and hybridization. Excuse me. So, uh, it's a situation that cannabis is still most popularly employed by smoking. Uh, but this remains, even when cannabis is legalized, smoking, particularly in public, is, is legal in most jurisdictions. Inhalation is the 
method of administration that's most likely to produce a rapid rise in serum and brain levels. Uh, so it's, it's got very rapid pharmacokinetics, onset and offset, meaning that repetitive dosing is necessary to maintain the effect, whether that be recreational or therapeutic. Um, with modern high-potency varieties, it's easy to overshoot. It may be that one inhalation is more than you needed to reduce your uh, nausea or reduce your pain. Uh, it's actually, smoking is extremely inefficient. Depending on the technique, it's often the case that only 10 to 30 percent of the material is available, bioavailable. Um, smoking produces polyaromatic hydrocarbons, potential carcinogens, the way that cigarettes do. Uh, it is true to say that cannabis-only smokers do not get lung cancer because THC and other components are counteracting it, but your body still has to break that stuff down. Um, and it is a reason that um, no smoked material is ever going to be approved by the FDA and most other regulatory bodies. Uh, better is vaporization. Um, there's a depiction here of different temperatures um, and uh, using this device called the volcano for its obvious shape. Um, so this does reduce uh, the amount of these undesirable components, but unfortunately, it has not been documented to date that any of these devices totally eliminate polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Additionally, a lot, or most cannabis, I should say, is grown with synthetic fertilizers and may produce ammonia, a, a neurotoxin upon um, inhalation. Um, so it is going to pose similar regulatory hurdles. I would emphasize this is a far better method of administration as compared to smoking, but um, may not be the answer uh, for most people. For chronic conditions, um, medically, uh, a tincture or oral administration is almost always going to be better. Um, but um, oral administration often means edibles, and we see some older um, things that were purposely designed to look like candy. Uh, you can see why um, law enforcement doesn't like this idea. This is obviously attractive to children that shouldn't be using this material. Um, right. um, we also have a movement towards more powerful preparations. And this is true of selective breeding of cannabis. Um, uh, also, the extraction techniques. Um, however, despite all our um, advances, um, there's an old-fashioned way to make stronger stuff, and that is making hashish. Um, with sieving of the material, as you see on this, uh, it's possible to get THC or overall uh, uh, cannabinoid concentrations upwards of 60%. And, um, I think that's plenty. Um, but People have gone on uh, from that to make cannabis concentrates. Uh, usually cannabis is going to be extracted with polar solvents, many of which are flammable and potentially explosive. Um, in uh, my area of the world, um, periodically there'll be something in the paper uh, about uh, so-and-so blew up their house or started a fire because they were trying to um, purge uh, the material that they were making in the kitchen of uh, butane or what other, whatever other solvent. Um, you may hear of RSO, which is uh, short for Rick Simpson oil. Rick Simpson was a Canadian. He didn't originate this technique. He has advocated using naphtha, which is a, a petroleum distillate, uh, which is distinctly unsafe cannot be properly purged from the material, um, etc. These concentrates, uh, even users will acknowledge uh, that they're more likely to produce tolerance. Uh, many of these will be associated with a lot of bad reactions, including uh, orthostatic hypotension in which the person will inhale 
and essentially loses consciousness. Uh, they've got such a vagal reaction, the heart slows down and they pass out and may fracture something on the way down. Uh, despite all that, uh, in Washington State, where I live, uh, this is well over 50% of sales at this time. It's what the kids like, although you know, we may need to educate them as to better ways to do things. There are also a lot of misconceptions in the industry. This is a prior generation of a vape pen. Um, we see so-called wax here. Uh, this is the heating element, and upon actuation, it's red hot in seconds. Um, so this is a misnomer. This isn't vaporization. It's a form of burning. Um, just an uh, easier way to do it, and uh, easier to hide as well. Uh, additionally, um, vape pens, and it, this was a study, I should point out, was done with uh, a nicotine vape pen. But if the propellant includes uh, propylene glycol and glycerol, when it is overheated, and I emphasize overheated, you can get production of formaldehyde, and that's uh, uh, also a group one carcinogen, and uh, might be more dangerous than the cigarette would have been. Uh, additionally, I'm sure that you've all heard about uh, an epidemic of uh, pneumonitis associated with vape pens that seems to be primarily, if not exclusively, attributable to vitamin E acetate. Vitamin E acetate apparently is quite safe when taken orally. Um, it has a property of looking like uh, a uh, viscous uh, cannabis extract. Uh, it has the same consistency, but this ends up coating the lungs and people are dying from this. And it has nothing to do with toxicity of cannabis itself. So if we're going to be scientific about this, um, it's another byproduct of prohibition and, and poor education. Um, you, if you haven't figured it out by now, we're a bit hither and yon here. I have a real problem putting together these and uh, changing topics, uh, but we're doing a lot of that. But I wanted to depict uh, the difference between preparations. Um, this is what used to be called um, so far uh, hash from Morocco. Um, this is nabiximols or, or Sativex, and you can see the THC and CBD, um, a smattering, not much, of terpenoids um, as compared to the so far, which has got all this other stuff. This other stuff could be soap, it could be wax, it could be camel dung. So it's not stuff that was designed to go into your lungs. Um, to make a pharmaceutical from cannabis, you'd rather need a, a lot better quality control. And this is a depiction of that. What we've got here is 25 batches of nabiximols or Sativex over nine years. And I think you'll agree that it looks like single peaks of these various cannabinoids. There is a very tight uh, regulation. For most herbal-based drugs, um, in the past, uh, you've been allowed to have plus minus 10% on a given component. But that's been lowered to plus minus 5%. And I would maintain here that this is well below that. For better or worse, this is the benchmark that's been set. And uh, any other drug uh, that's cannabis-based that's going to go to the FDA or other regulatory bodies is likely going to have to hit the same kind of benchmark. Um, and an illustration of something I, I just talked about, the difference in, in pharmacokinetics. So this is what happens with uh, smoked cannabis in the blue or vaporized in the red very steep onset uh, of activity. And um, uh, just for reference, 80 nanograms per milliliter is what is a typical target for the recreational user. At that point, most people are going to feel high. Here, you've doubled that, um, but it doesn't last so long. Um, it's rapidly coming down within the hour. 
Um, but the effects in the brain are going to last longer than that. But typically, people will want to repeat the dose within three hours. In comparison, um, we've got satellites <coughs> here, and uh, we've got single digits. This should not produce intoxication. Um, and uh, you know, these, this was designed to be equivalent doses. And so this is administered or mucosally, spread in the mouth. Some is absorbed through the mucosa, some is swallowed, uh, but a much slower contour that allows dosing typically only two or three times a day. Um, people are worried about development of tolerance, which is a major issue with recreational use of THC, uh, particularly with concentrates, as we mentioned. Um, one of the worries in developing cannabis-based drugs is would it lose effect? Would you have to be chasing the dose like typically you do with opioids and treating pain? Well, the answer is no. Um, and this was done in MS patients. What we've got is a year and a half of activity. And in fact, the dose has been steady and actually goes down slightly over time to maintain the same level of clinical efficacy. And uh, again, with intoxication, uh, this is uh, Sativex versus placebo. We have single digits out of 100. Again, something like 80 is going to represent what people want for a high. 20 is threshold of feeling high. Um, and this was done in patients who were typically on polypharmacy during the clinical trial. Anyway, so the bottom line was that uh, it was hard for people to tell whether they were on placebo or on Sativex, and that's one of the hallmarks of a well-blinded study. Um, now we're going to shift gears into an article I wrote uh, with Caroline McCollum a couple of years ago. We were struck by the fact that although there was good information available in some places, like in some books, um, in terms of how do you dose and administer cannabis. Uh, so we thought that we'd write this article uh, so that nobody could say uh, what I still hear from professionals, uh, which is nobody knows how to use it, uh, which is, is just false at this point. Um, different routes of administration, we've talked about this uh, already, um, smoking, vaporization, oral, and then other roots, which I'll just mention briefly. Topicals, great for the skin. Uh, the terpenoids get through, the cannabinoids do not. You cannot treat a systemic illness with topical administration. There are a lot of people that treat sore joints and, and say it works instantly. Well, physiologically that can't be. I think what they're getting um, is a a counter irritant effect or something else. Um, if it works, that's great, but um, it's likely not getting into the joint at all. For um, rectal administration, great for hemorrhoids, but um, there's no good evidence of uh, the cannabinoids are, are absorbed uh, rectally. Um, there's a pro drug that was made, uh, THC hemisuccinate, that they thought got any better, but um, uh, we'll typically hear that a cancer patient was taking a high dose via suppository but didn't get high. Didn't get high tells me that the medicine wasn't getting in. Instead, they were making an expensive excrement. So, <laughs> um, uh, this is just uh, onset duration uh, kind of stuff. Uh, as I mentioned already, you've got very rapid onset and offset with smoking and vaporization, much better uh, prolonged uh, intervals with oral administration. So that's an advantage medically. Um, every 18 years or so, uh, the American government will have a consortium of people get together and say, what's the deal with cannabis? Uh, what's it good for? How is it bad? Uh, and so this is done um, uh, a few years back. Um, 
they picked a really bad time to stop their data collection. Uh, so they cut it off in 2016, just as they were getting the clinical trial results with Epidiolex, which is a 97% pure CBD preparation to treat seizures. Um, but um, they said basically that um, THC was good for spasticity and uh, for treating nausea and chemotherapy, um, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but there was nothing, um, they didn't feel there was any good information about seizures. Um, so we thought we would tackle this ourselves. And I'm afraid this is hard to read. I'm going to do it off the big one here. Uh, so this is a conclusive or substantial evidence of efficacy in treating chronic pain in adults, uh, in treating multiple scores of spasticity, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, treatment of intractable seizures in Dravet and Lennox Gastaut syndrome, that's for CBD. Moderate evidence of efficacy in improving in outcome and sleep disturbance associated with chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, sleep apnea. Uh, limited evidence um, in uh, symptoms of dementia, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. With dementia, there hasn't been a decent uh, sized clinical trial with a real cannabis-based preparation, just THC. Um, and it goes on from here. Um, they said limited evidence of Tourette's syndrome. Uh, clinicians that use it will tell you that it works very well. Um, and then uh, other things like uh, treatment of addiction, um, where again, we have a tremendous amount of anecdotal evidence that can be quite helpful. Um, Bottom line is that uh, we have a lag in the literature. Um, experienced clinicians that use this material will report, uh, as patients as well, will report efficacy in many conditions. The reason for this versatility goes back to the endocannabinoid system. Endocannabinoid system affects every aspect of physiology, so it should not surprise us so much that um, cannabinoids that are modulating the endocannabinoid system may be applicable quite widely. Side effects, uh, adverse events so-called, these are going to be familiar to almost everybody, and these relate primarily to uh, psychiatric issues, uh, drowsiness, fatigue, dizziness, and this is all related to THC. Dry mouth, cough, phlegm, anxiety, um, contrary to expectations, nausea, and cognitive effects. Um, some people get euphoric or could have blurred vision or get a headache. Um, and then the rare things that I mentioned, orthostatic hy hypotension, with extreme doses, particularly of um, concentrates, uh, toxic psychosis, which is a self-limited um, uh, anxiety and delusions. Um, And then uh, one that I'll just mention briefly, cannabinoid hyperemesis. This was first described um, uh, about 15 years ago in Australia, um, but the index case was actually in 1996. This only occurs in the context of people using high THC on a chronic basis. And a uh, very strange situation, uh, people get intractable abdominal pain and vomiting with a very strange behavior of taking hot baths or showers for hours on end, uh, which alleviates the symptoms temporarily. It also responds to continuous application of a capsaicin ointment. Um, we don't know the, the pathophysiology of this yet, but I have a theory, and uh, I'm glad to say that research is underway and hopefully have an answer in a few months. Um, in relation to the toxic psychosis, um, I have vivid recollections of this. As part of the Sativex development program when I was with GW, we were asked uh, to do QTC interval studies. This is the idea of, and now every drug in the U.S. has to show that 
high doses of it don't produce conduction abnormalities in the heart. Um, so we were asked to use huge doses of Sativex, as much as 40 milligrams of THC at a time, even in naive individuals. Um, I was in Toronto uh, when the first group of patients were dosed, and naturally one of them had this reaction. Um, but he was talked down and was all right the next day, uh, and I flew back to Seattle. Um, however, I guess it was lucky or unlucky because there was one out of the first four patients had that, but overall there were only four out of 246 that had this reaction at this huge dose. Um, the same exact thing has been noted with pure THC with no CBD at a fraction of the dose, even as little as 10 or 15 milligrams. So we've got this tremendous safety factor that was induced by having CBD in conjunction with the THC. Um, this is a demonstration in the, the um, blue We've got the earlier Sativex patients with uh, multiple sclerosis. They were allowed much higher doses and a very rapid titration. Subsequently, it was shown that doses above 12 sprays per day, which would be 32.4 milligrams of THC and 30 milligrams of CBD, above that level, you're adding the side effects without adding to efficacy. So that was capped. That, that was, uh, became the high dose. When the dose was capped and slowed down, the
Um, we need to know the specific cannabinoid content and the specific terpenoid content because those are going to be the determinants of how it affects a patient. And then we, we're interested in this taste when it's inhaled and it's scent, of course, but most particularly with the effects on humans. Um, my colleague Mark Lewis at Naper Research developed uh, what's called phytofacts that you see on the right here. And I think this is a nice thing. Um, uh, you have the total cannabinoid and terpenoid content, uh, the top two cannabinoids uh, in the donut, a listing of the top several cannabinoids by their percentages, picture of the bud. Then it gets really interesting. We've got um, depiction of uh, plants with the, the common um, components, uh, terpenoid-wise. And you see uh, citrus here for limonene and um, caryophylline from the black pepper. And then, again, interesting, what do consumers say about it in terms of the effect? Uh, high in energy, uh, et cetera. Uh, so on one page, this provides a very good description of the biochemical content and the effects. And it is possible for the cons potential consumer, whether recreational or, or um, uh, therapeutic, to have a good idea of how this material that they're about to purchase may affect them. And I'd like to give you some demonstrations. So this is an example of Harlequin, which is a type 3, uh, I'm sorry, was one of the early uh, California plants that expressed higher amounts of CBD type 2 plant, um, but it wasn't um, exactly uh, a one-to-one -one ratio at all. Um, although a lot of people, when they're describing CBD chemovars, will put CBD first, the tradition has been to put THC first, and so that's the convention to which I will adhere. So this THC to CBD rate, ratio in this one is a 1 to 2.2. Overall, this is very low in terpenoids, only 1.1%. High these days would be 5% or greater. And as an illustration of what I said earlier, you see that the dominant terpenoid is mercy. And it would be just this kind of preparation that leads to the misconception that CBD is sedating, and it is not. Um, this will be because of the mercy, but not because of the CBD. What if you wanted a lot of mercy? Well, as it turns out, you can selectively breed for terpenoid content. Um, this is a 1 to 1.8 THC to CBD ratio. Um, you've got a higher total terpenoid content at 3.44% out of, uh, I'm sorry, 4.8% total, 3.44% mercy alone. So you've got this huge amount of mercy, and this is definitely going to be a sedating kind of uh, experience as well. Um, unless you're trying to go to sleep, this isn't going to be the delighting of most patients, for sure. Better would be this. Uh, so this is a non-sedating uh, alternative, and you see that the highest uh, bar is uh, for pinene, the green one. Uh, as mentioned previously, the pinene is going to reduce, reduce short-term memory impairment from THC, allowing concentration and focus. Uh, and it's really got a phenomenal level, 2.01% um, of pinene alone, so about half of the total. Um, so this is a real medical uh, chemovar. It's got THC and CBD, um, not perfectly balanced, but, but pretty good. The mercine is quite low down here. Um, so this would be great for a chronic pain patient. You're going to have benefit of the THC and CBD. You've got pinene, and this is a kind of thing where somebody should be able to function and, and use this at the same time. Uh, so this is a really desirable profile. Then, um, this is like the holy grail of selective breeding here. Um, as you see on the bottom, you, I think you'll agree that these seem to be identical terpenoid profiles. But what we've got is 
um, very different cannabinoid profiles. This is type 1, THC predominant, type 2, THC and CBD together, type 3, CBD predominant. So, through selective breeding, you can dial in exactly what you want while retaining the terpenoid profile. And the same thing can be done with almost any combination that is desirable. Um, this was not done through genetic modification. This was not done with CRISPR technology. This was done with good old-fashioned Mendelian breeding techniques and a lot of analysis on seedlings. They did not wait um, to grow out through the whole uh, cycle. Um, and uh, there was probably a lot of culling uh, that went on in the meantime. But this is the way that you get what you want in terms of targets for clinical use. Um, I'm sorry, I should go back. So obviously here, what we've got is uh, pinene dominance with the different cannabinoid profiles. And we can have the same thing with limonene dominance, quite obviously here in the yellow. And again, um, type 1, type 2, type 3. And finally, you can do the same thing with caryophylline. Again, we're interested in caryophylline because of its ability to be anti-inflammatory and analgesic without producing intoxication. Uh, and again, the varying um, cannabinoid profiles. Uh, this is another example, type 2, with a mixed terpenoid profile. Uh, you've got balanced amounts of limonene in yellow, uh, linalool in uh, the lavender color, caryophylline in the blue. Uh, myrcene is coming in about fourth. Uh, patients reported calm and inspiration for this. And uh, clinically, I could tell you that in this preparation, you could use it to treat burns. Um, you could use it to treat epilepsy because it, it combines different components that would have application into obviously unrelated conditions. Uh, so this is a type 3 uh, CBD predominant plant. It is very high in, in caryophylline. Um, I don't know what happened to the T on that. It used to be there. Um, so this is being non-sedating. The THC is really low. It's uh, below 1%. Uh, the mercine is almost gone entirely. Uh, you've got uh, a good amount of caryophylline, limonene, and humulene. Patients said that it produced comfort. Uh, this could be good for pain, for inflammation. Um, because of the CBD and caryophylline content, um, it would be good for treating addiction and also anxiety and depression. So this would be one versatile profile, the kind of thing that uh, really would be worth breeding. Uh, here's another type 3, but in this one, you've got roughly equal amounts of CBD and CBDV. Okay, so cannabidivarin, we haven't really discussed here before. This, uh, among other things, uh, seems to be good for treating epilepsy, as CBD does, but this works on a different kind of seizure, focal seizures or seizures of partial onset. And the combination of the two together, particularly because you've got uh, some caryophylline and uh, a bit of linalool in there, um, means you've got at least four different anticonvulsants in this preparation. Um, if you ask, could this be as good or better than epidiolex, the answer is it's a fair bet. Um, so um, this would be very worthwhile to investigate. Um, I think this is an important point I wanted to be able to illustrate. Uh, so we've got the so-called cashmere blue here. Uh, the flowers on the left, um, it is uh, uh, type 3 CBD <coughs> predominant. Um, in its native state, it's got good amounts of uh, caryophylline down here and uh, limonene, the mercine is relatively low. Then, you make a CO2 extract out of it, um, and uh, you can kick the CBD up to 67%, um, but 
the turbinate content um, uh, is only 3.4% in the concentrate. Um, and it's switched from, um, it's now become uh, dominant in humulene, um, where it might be an anti-inflammatory. We don't know as much about um, what it does. The point here is that, um, yeah, you've really concentrated the cannabinoids, but um, you squandered the um, the turbinate content. And there, there may be better ways of doing this. One obvious better way in terms of preserving turbinate content would be to use cold ethanol extraction. Um, again, we're hither and yon. I want to talk about pesticides in, in cannabis. So some years ago, um, Sullivan et al. did a study they spiked um, pesticides, honey cannabis, and put it through a smoking machine to see how much they could recover. Unfortunately, what they found out is it gets through just fine, uh, despite uh, the burning process, and between 40 to 70 percent gets through in the smoke. Unfortunately, again, that stuff's highly bioavailable. So if you smoke it, it's going to get into your body as well with all of the subsequent problems. But there really hadn't been a good study of what was actually in cannabis that was out there. Um, Washington State legalized, in, legalized cannabis in 2012, but it really didn't become available in that market until 2014. We took um, 26 samples uh, that were purchased in the legal market. Uh, they went through a chain of custody to a state-sponsored lab. Um, and we analyze them. Um, because concentrates are what the kids are using, um, most of them are concentrates rather than flour. But unfortunately, the vast majority, some 85%, were positive for pesticides. And it wasn't a little. It was a lot, and typically multiple pesticides in each one, uh, even hundreds of thousands of parts per billion. We found 24 different agents, including fungicides, miticides, insecticides, uh, and included organophosphates, organochlorides, and neonicotinoids, which have been one of the factors uh, in colony collapse disorder in bees, and it kills all kinds of bees, um, whether they be workers, drones, or queens. Uh, so this is really unfortunate and an ecological disaster. Um, I've got a contributor here in this regard. Um, take that down. Um, we've got 24 different insecticides. These are the structures, and I'll, I'll just illustrate one. Uh, Carbaryl was found if there were, uh, there is no pesticide in the U.S. that is used legally on cannabis. You also cannot legally get organic certification for cannabis in my country. If there were a legal uh, limit, this particular sample would be over 250 times that amount. Um, Carbaryl is known as a bad actor, meaning that it has toxicities in multiple different uh, areas. So uh, it's a cholinesterase inhibitor at a level that can produce seizures, even in people that haven't had a tendency. No carcinogen and a developmental reproductive toxin and a suspected endocrine disruptor, and we already have enough of those in the environment in the U.S. We also have the danger of um, recruiting heavy metals into cultivated material. Cannabis is a bioaccumulator. So that's a great thing if you want to grow hemp and on the Chernobyl contamination site and try and get the radiation out of the soil. It's a bad thing if you're going to consume cannabis uh, that has heavy metals in it. So this is primarily lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. Um, this is something that should be screened for, I believe, in any cannabis that is sold, whether it be in a recreational or medical context. So we need assays for, for cannabinoids, for terpenoids, um, for uh, 
pesticides and heavy metals. And this is all information that should be available to the consumer. Um, switching gears again, um, this is uh, an example of the kind of study of cannabis that's done in my country. Uh, the uh, legal situation is that no cannabis can be used in a clinical trial unless it's applied by the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Their material is not standardized. That means that even if you had a successful <coughs> result, you couldn't reproduce it. And that is by design. This is a system that is designed to fail, and in that, it succeeds very well. Uh, because the government uh, does not want uh, there to be uh, proven uses of cannabis um, in this fashion. But this study was done by our friend Donald Abrams in San Francisco. It was for HIV-associated neuropathy. Um, the patients were required to have had experience with cannabis, which means instantly you're eliminating 50% of possible candidates. Um, this was smoked cannabis three times a day for five days, which is too short. When you're looking at neuropathy, the, the recommendation is to study for 12 weeks, but they didn't want people to have that. The good news is that it worked and reduced pain. The bad news is that with smoked cannabis, the side effects were very prominent. Anxiety, 25%. Sedation, 54%. Disorientation, 16%. Hurt when they shouldn't. Um, gas hurts. Um, too much stool hurts. Um, and uh, there is too much or too little. People can have uh, diarrhea. They can have constipation. Or they can have combinations of both. Um, and it is, uh, for people who have it, very disturbing. It seriously interferes with their life, um, even though they look like they're OK. Um, this is work that was done in Australia, and, uh, just basically showing, um, looking at uh, normal tissue from the gut and how the endocannabinoid system worked on it. Um, and the implication at that time, back in 2007, was that the endocannabinoid system uh, was closely related to these inflammatory states, um, particularly in inflammatory bowel uh, diseases, but also in irritable bowel, seemingly. Uh, the Mayo Clinic showed that um, there was some genetic tendency abnormalities in subsets of people that had irritable bowel. That's all I want to really say there. Um, switching to fibromyalgia, um, work that was, was done in Germany, um, I don't get this, but their ethics committee thought it was unethical to have control groups. They'd allow them to take THC, but not to not give them THC. Anyway, um, it didn't make sense to me. Um, they were very aggressive in <laughs> dosing. As mentioned previously, you don't want to give 15 milligrams of THC without CBD uh, to patients. So most people couldn't titrate to the highest dose. Only four stayed in. But if we look at the ones who did uh, stay in, um, there was no change in their allodyne on the skin. Um, but there were prominent reductions in pain. Something that we know already is that fibromyalgia patients do well with cannabis and a lot better than they do with plain THC. And if we look at this graphically, um, if this were controlled, it would have been statistically significant, the reduction of pain from 8.1 to 2.8. Um, Similarly, there have been other not great studies done with nabalone. Nabalone is a semi-synthetic. Uh, it's 10 times the potency of THC. Um, they looked at this in fibromyalgia and had significant benefits on pain. Um, a fibromyalgia impact questionnaire and anxiety. Um, and then our friend Mark Ware uh, compared nabalone to amitriptyline. Uh, neither one was great, um, but they slept better. Um, again, I, I don't think this is a great drug, and who 
haven't spent a lot of time. Uh, there was a study done acutely in Spain um, where the patients smoke cannabis, and you see, again, significant reductions in pain, stiffness, um, and feelings of well-being. But um, this is not the kind of information that regulators would think much of because it's not over time, and this is a chronic condition. Our best evidence is this. This is not a randomized controlled trial, it rather is a survey. But this is in 1,300 patients. That's a lot of fibromyalgia. Um, what they did was ask about reactions to three FDA-approved drugs. You've got deloxetine, which is a mixed uh, SSRI, SNRI, um, milnasopran, and pregabalin. And pregabalin is a anticonvulsant masquerading as a drug for pain. What you see is that the FDA-approved drugs for fibromyalgia didn't work worth a damn, according to the patients. And cannabis was much preferred. Um, the numbers are not huge, but you know, you've got about 100 patients there. Um, so I mean, I, I look at this and I say, what's wrong with this picture? You've got an illegal drug that works great, according to the patients, and three FDA-approved drugs that don't work at all. Um, switching to migraine, um, I really felt that migraine was one of the best candidates for clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, which is what I call this syndrome, if you will. Um, and one of the studies I suggested be done was to look at the cerebrospinal fluid of uh, patients with migraine compared to controls, recognizing that in my country, I could never get this study approved because you can't do lumbar punctures on normal patients. But in Italy, they did. So, um, and uh, the results are really remarkable. Um, in the controls, you see this uh, level of, um, of anandamide in the CSF as compared to the right in the migraine patients, and the p-value is wild, 1 in 10,000 likelihood that this is due to chance. Um, that's pretty much it. I think we got proof here of the theory. Um, and they said reduced anandamide levels in the CSF of chronic migraine patients support the hypothesis of the failure of this endogenous system in chronic migraine. And go on from there, but basically proving uh, that this has something to do with the endocannabinoid system. And then there were subsequent uh, studies that were done on uh, levels of endocannabinoids in the platelets, which are considerably reduced in migraine patients, and again, statistically significant. Uh, more genetic stuff. Um, looking at CB1 uh, gene, uh, the CNR1, which is on the sixth chromosome, uh, this was linked to migraine and associated things, um, that these patients were more neurotic, which is a term I thought was dropped from the vocabulary. Uh, they had a greater tendency towards depression and substance abuse. So, um, but again, suggestion of a genetic linkage. Um, to date, even though I grew up, uh, I started trying to do a controlled uh, study of cannabis and migraine in 1996. To date, 24 years later, it's never been done. But this is the, sort of the best information we got. This is an observational study from Colorado. This was in a cannabis clinic, sort of a self-selected population, but there was a substantial reduction in the frequency and severity of, of um, migraine attacks per month after using cannabis. Um, this is subject to all the caveats. The FDA would look at this and shrug, but you have to say that there seems to be a signal there, and this is a worthy subject for a randomized controlled trial, which still has not taken place. Um, my friend and colleague, uh, John McPartland, uh, wrote what I like to call the article of the decade on the care and feeding of the endocannabinoid system. Um, 
he picked up the idea of clinical endocannabinoid deficiency and listed uh, these disorders. Um, subsequently, there's been an excellent study by Hill et al. They looked at uh, people that were involved in 9-11 uh, World Trade Center. Um, they looked at the people that were there who developed post-traumatic stress and those that didn't and looked at their uh, serum uh, endocannabinoid levels. Um, and there was this big difference. Um, so there's a correlation of lower serum and anamide levels um, to in increased uh, CB1 receptor binding sites in CNS, bottom line being that the people that expressed um, PTS um, seem to have clinical endocannabinoid deficiency of a type. Um, so uh, this, again, really provides some rational basis for using cannabis to treat that condition. And there have been various studies uh, to date, none of them well controlled or with optimized preparations, unfortunately. So where do we need to go? Um, obviously, we need better studies, particularly for uh, IBS, fibromyalgia, and migraine. Uh, it'd be great if we had schemes of the brain that non-invasively could assess the state of people's receptors or their endocannabinoid levels. But we're not there yet. Um, we can also look at genetic markers. Um, this has begun to be done. Uh, there's some genomic testing that um, some companies are doing now and can tell you um, whether you've got abnormalities in any of these genes. And some of them actually will recommend a type of cannabis that might suit you based on your uh, genetic endowment. Uh, we certainly need better controlled trials in these disorders. We know that clinically, all three of these and some of the others, including post-traumatic stress, uh, patients extensively use cannabis with good reports. Again, we just don't have the clinical trial data to back that up. Um, now, in the section here, I want to get a little bit New Zealand uh, specific. Um, I am not an expert on your policies. I've come to learn uh, some. I know that uh, the legislation that's in place is going to place you at the forefront of what is possible in cannabis therapeutics. I'm very excited for you and hope that we all can benefit from this uh, capability that's in the offing. So let's talk a little bit. First, I want everybody to understand what makes a medicine. I like to talk about the four pillars. You have to show efficacy, and that comes from phase one to three randomized controlled trials. You need to show safety, same way. You need consistency, uh, standardization. This is particularly a challenge with a uh, botanical, uh, a medicine from a plant that has many components. But as we saw with the example of Sativex, 25 batches over nine years, it's been done, it can be done again. So no one should harbor illusions that you cannot make uh, real medicine from a plant. And then, um, so those are the usual three. I throw the fourth, which is medicine has gotta be accessible. It ain't a medicine if you can't get it. Can't get it means that it's illegal, there isn't any, or it's too expensive to access. Um, so that really, um, should be just as important as the others. Um, and the, these are the different levels of medical proof. Uh, with cannabis, we've got a bunch of case series and historical case control studies. Um, we've got a few small randomized controlled trials. We don't have a lot of the large randomized controlled trials. A lot of that is political. A lot of that has to do with incredible costs associated with this and the, the absence of a likelihood that a company is going to get a return on their investment. And that's what it's all about in business, although some of us don't like to hear it. Um, there actually is a blueprint uh, from the FDA. I recognize a lot of this sounds US-centric, but 
uh, for better or worse, we're responsible for prohibition um, and we're responsible for a lack of progress um, in these areas, even though we've got a population that is a lot bigger than yours. <laughs> we'll never have a rugby team that can match yours. Um, but there is this blueprint uh, called the Botanical Drug Development Guidance for Industry. Um, to cut through a bunch of stuff, the process is like it is for any other drug. You've got to go through the randomized controlled trials. You've got to go through chemistry, manufacturing, and control. Um, you have to identify all those little peaks. Um, and that can happen a little bit later in the course. You've got to go through the toxicology and everything else. Um, now, we've got some other challenges in doing uh, controlled studies of cannabis, and a lot of it has to do with the placebo effect. And we're facing a real crisis here. This has been the sine qua non of how you make a medicine. Um, randomized controlled trials. Uh, the problem is it ain't working anymore. What we've seen over time is that we have an increase in placebo responses. Um, and it is compounded in a situation where uh, you're treating pain or other subjective measures. We don't have a thing that you put on your forehead that tells you what your pain level is. Um, we don't have a Star Trek device that, that tells you that. It's got to come from what the patient says it is. Um, and it's really compounded in a situation where the, the drug is psychoactive. It's further compounded if the drug has a reputation of being miraculous, like people believe about mm -hmm. cannabis. I'm here to tell you it is not miraculous. It can be really good. Um, but psychologically, the patient is going to feel, well, I really hope or expect that I'm getting cannabis uh, based medicine and not the placebo. And this belief leads to a clinical improvement getting that or, or not. And it is the case that just being in a clinical trial uh, generates improvement. Um, it's gotten to the point that this has gotten worse over time so that um, it's hard to tell even when a good drug really is better than placebo. Um, we've seen an increase in the placebo response in neuropathic pain studies uh, significantly over a couple of decades. And uh, there are details here in the study if you're really interested in this. I'd highly recommend this. Uh, we made the situation worse. Um, the idea of the impact studies was to increase the duration of study in pain from five weeks, which is the way it was in the prior decade, to 12 weeks, which is what is required now for most indications. But in doing this, we actually had an increase in uh, placebo responses. Uh, so it may well have been counterproductive if you're trying to show that a drug really works. With Sativex, uh, there was abundant evidence that the studies were well-blinded um, because there was no difference in the amount of euphoria that was reported in people um, on placebo as uh, uh, opposed to Sativex. Um, and there was no difference in the efficacy um, uh, in the two groups. Um, there was no difference um, in the results clinically in people who used cannabis before versus those who, who didn't. Um, and with regulators where Sativex was approved, uh, it was felt that this is well blinded. So that was with an oral mucosally administered medicine with a slow contour of activity. As uh, so we've seen previously, because of side effects like anxiety um, and, and that, with inhaled cannabis, it's, it's really not possible on um, most of the time to blind adequately, uh, which is another reason that it's very unlikely that an inhaled form of cannabis-based medicine is going to get approved uh, by regulators. So how do you overcome these problems with the placebo effect? Um, some of the early studies of uh, side effects and spasticity did not read out 
Um, so they wanted to try an enhanced design. Um, and this is what's called a randomized withdrawal design. What patients were told was, you'll get sad effects at some point. Unbeknownst to them, everyone who went in got sad effects for a month. And then they just took the responders, people that had shown a, a decrement in their spasticity levels, were then came in for a resupply visit. And they were then randomized so that um, Patients would either get the same number of sprays per day that they got before with Sativex, and half would get the same number of sprays of placebo. And then you see this nice divergence in effect. Uh, the patients with Sativex had continued reduction in spasticity, and the patients who got placebo had regression. Um, but the same thing was tried subsequently in another trial and didn't work um, for all the men reasons we've mentioned before. But um, this design was responsible for the ultimate approval in 30 countries of um, Sativex. So what can, what can one do? Um, in any clinical trial, I think it's necessary to limit the patient's expectation. It should not be, oh, we've got this great new drug we want to test, so why don't you go into this clinical trial and it should be great, okay? That's a recipe for disaster. Um, what should be said is this drug may or may not help you. Uh, patients should be treated in a neutral fashion. You should not have a situation of what we call ancillary benefits. Now, some studies have been in clinics where you not only get the medicine, but you get a free massage or you get a consultation with the herbalist. Um, that's again, a recipe, everyone's going to improve under these conditions. They want to go and they're going to feel better, invariably. And as mentioned previously, you need a slow absorption technique, uh, like not inhalation. Uh, hopefully, the preparation is, isn't overtly psychoactive. Uh, it should be balanced, uh, have some CBD as well as THC. Um, bad examples. Um, the company that made uh, synthetic THC decided that they should have an inhaled variety. So uh, they made this inhaler. Um, and they found that they were getting side effects, uh, tachycardia and psychiatric adverse events, uh, with as low as 1.2 milligrams of inhaled THC. Um, so yeah, this helped with headaches, um, but uh, they never developed it, never got missed through the FDA either. Um, there's been only one study of smoked cannabis that seemed to be well-blinded. It was again done by Mark Ware. Um, they used Canadian cannabis. It was single inhalation through a stone pipe. Um, and they were able to get um, decreases in pain responses. Um, with uh, this moderate um, potency material. Uh, the estimation was probably about, again, 1.4 milligrams of THC per dose. So it's a tiny amount as compared to what we would calculate um, was in the material originally. And it's just, again, because smoking has poor bioavailability. Um, and this is a the Psyche device of first generation. Um, and this is just all my criticism of the study, including that three of the 10 prototypes melted. Um, so, uh, anyway, that's uh, described in detail in, in this article. Um, other concerns, uh, drug abuse liability. Bottom line is, um, Sativex and Invixamals was tested and uh, wasn't really different to uh, Marinol at uh, low doses and at um, high doses it uh, seemingly had a lower drug abuse liability um, anyway. Uh, because of that, it was uh, approved in, in many countries. Um, so what's wrong with the clinical trials? You've heard a litany of this already. Um, American studies have almost all been way too short. You saw the five-day example when 12 weeks, which is 
what was needed. Uh, they've all been too small. Um, they uh, use unstandardized cannabis preparations, meaning they couldn't be reproduced by design. Um, as we've seen, blinding was inadequate and none of them would advance the regulatory process. We've also got problems with laboratory analysis. Um, again, some of this is USA-centric. Um, technically, um, almost all the labs in the US are operating with a Schedule One substance with no license to do so. They're using disparate techniques. There hasn't been standardization of procedures. Um, and uh, due diligence has often been lacking, leading to what's called dry labbing. That's a euphemism for the idea of, gee, it's got a lot of trichomes and um, we're out of reagents, so we'll just say that this is 12%. Um, and you think I'm kidding. I wish I were, but I'm not. This is the kind of thing that actually goes on in unscrupulous laboratories. Um, until recently, a lot of the standards um, that are used in the labs weren't available for specific cannabinoids. Um, the ones that were available were inaccurate, and I won't name names, but uh, they would uh, be recognizable to many of you. Properly speaking, uh, labs should uh, create their own uh, standards. Uh, it is true to say that the cannabinoids are difficult to assay, they're sticky, hard to work with. Terpenoids are even harder, unless someone has had facility with them, it's not going to work. You can't just take a weekend course in GCMS for dummies and set up your own business. Um, but people try. Um, with respect to New Zealand, what do you need? Well, um, everyone can benefit from greater breeding expertise. Uh, you've got to have the best possible genetics. Uh, may be helpful to know the genomics of the material so we know how things can be regulated. Um, things we still don't know include, um, we know some of the enzymes to get from this one to that one, but we don't know how these are regulated in the plant. I keep harping about this over the years, but nobody has uh, really investigated that. Uh, there's a need to optimize these ratios. Uh, we need to be able to get material, whether seeds or germplasm, from one place or another. <clears throat> so if we have a good chemovar in California, can we get it here in a legal fashion? Other issues include um, Genetic modification, which I'm against. Um, I, I like uh, Mendelian breeding and organic culture. We've talked about these other things, the pesticides, heavy metals, contaminants, uh, microbiological contaminants. We really have a deficit in our knowledge because this stuff isn't being taught in uh, medical schools. Um, I credit you for being here. Uh, and still a tremendous amount of opposition from the hierarchies, which include the insurers and medical societies. <clears throat> you have a lot of advantages here. <clears throat> you have some very progressive legislation that's going to allow you to be uh, market leaders in the industry. Um, there may be good genetics available now, but they could always be improved upon. I think that there are probably not a lot of type 2 or type 3 uh, plants available now. <clears throat> I doubt that there's any uh, cannabigerol or THCV predominant plants. Uh, these are all things that can be leveraged medically. A uh, big advantage is um, <clears throat> because of your high agricultural standards and uh, use of phytosanitary permits, New Zealand may be in a great position uh, to export to other countries. And uh, countries that have tried, Canada, Colombia, Israel, have been largely unsuccessful to date in trying to do this. Things against you is um, you've got a spread out country. Uh, you've got a lot of people living in rural areas that may not be able to get to centralized medical care. Um, it's not so easy to travel all the time. Um, 
under legalization medically, there may be a disincentive for people to be in clinical trials. Why should you take a 50-50 chance of getting placebo if you can access the medicine now? So, in this instance, uh, legalization is bad in terms of recruitment for studies. Um, and uh, reiteration, can we get uh, other material to you um, to help in your selective breeding programs? Well, in terms of what needs to be done, um, uh, pain is the number one reason that people use cannabis. It's about 70 to 80% in a given survey. Uh, but it should extend to conditions that haven't been particularly studied. Among those would be arthritis, whether rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is at all of one study with Sativex that was successful. It was done 15 years ago with no follow-up. That's a crying shame. In osteoarthritis, it may surprise you to know that uh, the uh, joint linings, uh, synovium has a uh, very rich supply of CD1. So it not just benefits from CBD, which would make sense uh, because of its anti-inflammatory capabilities, but pain is going to be largely mediated and best treated uh, with THC. Uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, uh, metabolic syndrome, and insulin resistance can be a pound a day while we were <laughs> So uh, needless to say, that didn't make it to the market. I think it's a stupid idea. Uh, the reason I say that is, what, where do we feel pain? It's in the brain, for goodness sake. Um, plus, um, there's nothing wrong with a weak, partial CB1 agonist. You just got to use the right dose. People are just um, not thinking properly about this. And again, there are ways of buffering that activity. When you have CBD with it, you're going to increase the therapeutic index. Again, meaning that you can use more of it without getting the side effects. Um, um, again, I'm being very critical, but uh, they, they're not uh, applying critical thought to this. Please. Well, it would depend on the dose. You know, if you ask, or are asking me, are you harming yourself by uh, daily intake? It, it really depends on the dose. If there is an excessive THC intake, you will induce tolerance. You will cause the CB1 receptors to become inactive. Um, and it will mean that you're taking a lot of medicine um, to less benefit um, in terms of pain control or whatever else. Could you also induce the hyper-hyper-energy Not in this instance. So it's a very good point. Um, to explain, uh, if people take opioids uh, too long and too high doses, they can actually produce hyperalgesia. They will make neuropathic pain worse. Um, this is generally not produced uh, by cannabis. Now, I have to back up and say that in acute pain situations like dental extractions, you do make the pain worse with THC by itself, okay? It's a lousy drug for acute pain. It is a really good drug for chronic pain. It's two very different things in this instance. Sure. It's, um, uh, well, I'm an uh, organic uh, fruit and berry grower myself. Um, I, <laughs> I just think it's totally unnecessary in cannabis. We've got a very classic genome in this plant. I showed you examples with conventional breeding. You can make it do anything you want. You just need to take the time. So I'm seeing GMO as an unnecessary shortcut on one level. Number two is 
no one has shown the ability to confine these way that they're not going to pollute the gene pool all over the planet. And there have been just repeated egregious examples in the U.S. of escape of um, GMO crops of one kind or another. Um, it's almost impossible in the U.S. outside of genuine organic uh, forms of corn to avoid using a GMO product. All of the uh, taco shells and everything else are, are GMO. Um, you know, in some countries they don't like this idea and don't allow that stuff in, and that's the way I feel. Uh, similarly, people make a distinction between CRISPR. For those of you not familiar, CRISPR is a technique to delete certain genes. And some people have interpreted that that's not genetic modification. Um, but to me, it obviously is. Um, I just don't accept an argument that it's not. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I'm afraid of. Plus, um, the industry in the U.S. is trying to make it impossible for the consumer to know whether yeah. something's GMO or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, you can't complain if you. Um, I, I'm not convinced of the safety of these materials um, either. I'm not a Luddite. I believe in science, but uh, that's a form of science I, I really don't like. Um, yeah, and there'll be people that vehemently disagree, but you know, I sure as hell want to know what I'm taking. And I look at ingredients, and there are a lot of things I, um, I would never eat, uh, even on a dare. <laughs> in the UK, there's uh, some concern about liver function tests with the CBD. Should I be checking my patient's livers? Uh, only if it's otherwise indicated. Uh, this is really overdone. The situation with respect to CBD is the following. Um, it's not dangerous to uh, the liver in any way in conventional dosing. The context of the problems with liver function have been with high-dose CBD isolates, i.e. Um, things like Epidiolex, in the context of polypharmacy in extremely sick patients, um, uh, and you know, with the, the likelihood of drug-drug interactions. Um, what we know is that uh, there will be drug-drug interactions with clopazam at high doses, and it leads to higher levels of a metabolite, N-dismethyl clopazam, which is very sedating. But the solution is to lower the clopazam dose, not to get rid of the uh, CBD. Um, the other uh, bad actor is valproate, which doesn't play well with others and is a drug that should be used as monotherapy anyway, but invariably it's taken with umpteen other drugs and you see these liver function abnormalities. So this has been played up the wazoo and um, I don't think there's a rational basis to it. And again, if you had a little bit of THC there, you wouldn't be needing these higher doses and you wouldn't be seeing uh, likely the, the same uh, degree of liver dysfunction, which is minimal to begin with. Um, yeah, I, I think it's being overplayed. Like it or not, there are people out there that are looking for every little excuse to keep these drugs illegal. Please. Um, you have a list of um, conditions of research that bottom we had sort of lifestyle, nutrition, and other, other things like that. On that um, sort of um, level, uh, what about sort of um, endogenous and dietary derived compounds like PEA and OEA and their potential use with um, fatty acids to sort of potentially treat? Yeah, uh, it's a tough one. Um, there have been various uh, studies that have tried to look what happens to endocannabinoid levels if you ingest fish oil uh, or different kinds of uh, fatty acids. Um, bottom line is it's really hard to manipulate um, either in a constructive or de uh, uh, destructive way um, because 
your body has its own innate mechanisms to try and keep things on a proverbial even keel. Um, what we do know, um, but I can't absolutely prove to you right now, um, is that uh, prebiotics and probiotics seem to enhance um, endocannabinoid tone.